Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Drew Corbett. I'm the city manager, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and thank you all for coming out. It's an exciting time in our general plan process. As you're aware, uh, during the early part of this year, the community worked to, to create the vision for what our community is going to be, and that vision's uh, on a, four places on the wall. And so now we're moving into this, really the second phase of the general plan update, which is how do we get there, right? And this is a really exciting time, and this is our first workshop in this second series of the how. And so, um, again, thank you all for spending your Saturday morning with us. We're, we're so glad that you're here and participating with us in this process. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Julia Klein, who is the project manager for the general plan. So we have a bilingual facilitator. Um, do you want to make an announcement here so everybody can hear? Si alguien habla español y necesita servicios de intérprete, por favor se pueden dirigir a mí. Mi nombre es Rosa y voy a estar aquí. Tenemos equipo para interpretar. Gracias. Thank you. So Rosa's here. Um, we're having bilingual facilitators at each of our uh, workshops, and so there's a headset, so she's uh, doing a live interpretation at the time that we're doing the workshops. Um, so thank you, Rosa, for being here today. Um, so hi, everybody. So my name is Julia, in case you don't know. Um, so I've been with the city almost 20 years now. I try not to count. Um, but anyway, um, you have in front of you the agenda for today's meeting, and we're here today to talk about the general plan. This is one of two workshops where we're starting to ask the community to help us identify areas in the city to study. And so the main presentation today, as well as the table exercises you'll be working on as a group, is focused on that. This is step one of a larger process. So <clears throat> welcome. Um, let's see if this uh, works. Hold on one second. Here we go. Uh, study areas workshop, June 2019. So. You, we have, uh, we're going to go ahead and go through um, introductions in a bit, um, presentation, group discussion and exercise, and then group report back, and we'll also cover next steps. So for the table introduction, so some of you are new, there are definitely new faces in the room today. Um, I'd like to have you partner with somebody you don't know. <clears throat> And in 90 seconds, ask, you know, introduce yourself. Um, what are, what's the reason that you are here today? And what do you hope to hear, learn, and share? So in case you get nervous, there's actually a correct way to do a handshake, <laughs> just so you need that. Um, so let's start, 90 seconds. <clears throat> You guys are all meeting more than one person. Great. A very good energy. You guys are doing absolutely great getting to know each other and meeting new community members. Very good. So since um, you guys are getting to know each other, I was wondering for me, um, can I get a show of hands for folks that are actually new to the general plan process? This is your first meeting on the general plan. Please raise your hand if this is your very first meeting. Wow, this very first meeting, thank you, welcome. I'm very excited to see you here today. Um, also a quick show of hands for people who have uh, participated at one or more general plan meetings and conversations. I'm so excited to see you guys still engage in all of this. This was wonderful. So um, <clears throat> what, thank you, thank you for meeting each other. And uh, let me flip to the next slide. <clears throat> so, um, for everyone, uh, our goal today is to provide an inclusive and informed dialogue. This is about getting to know each other, getting to know about our community with some uh, historic information and also some, uh, we'll go ahead and provide some future trend information. Um, the majority of the reason why we're having folks at a table and getting to know each other is so that community members can connect um, and also develop a shared sense of understanding about what are the different issues that each of us come to you know, as we live in San Mateo. Um, we're also here to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to ask for your help in identifying geographic areas or specific sites that you know of that the, you think that the city can and, uh, sort of look through and study as part of the general plan process. Um, <clears throat> this is one step. 
Um, it's, it, your meeting today is also one source of input. There's gonna be another meeting on Monday where we're hoping to hear from other community members. There's also meetings with the General Plan Subcommittee, Planning Commission, and City Council. And so this is one source of input. Um, and then all of this is part of a larger process, part of a larger effort. So most of you will not be uh, familiar with the 1872 map of San Mateo. It took a while to dig that up. But um, you know, San Mateo, as you can see you know, way back when, was a much smaller town. Um, and by the 1938, 1940s, you know, it's definitely grown. And where we're at today, we're you know, definitely built out as a community. <clears throat> And so, you know, as our, our, as our city grows, um, so has the rest of the county. You can see that as you drive around the Bay Area. Um, and it's reasonable to expect, you know, that the city and the region will continue to grow. So, again, this is a historic photo from turn, uh, 1900. Um, downtown is where San Mateo grew. You know, that, that was the center of the city, uh, the concept of, uh, the major, it, the city, uh, the town center growing around the major way that the community was getting around. That is Second Main Street. Very good. Um, and so uh, this is the historic, this, is, this train station is no longer there, but we, it, it is around the area, similar to the area that we have our current downtown train station. Um, you know, where downtown is today, you know, is, is uh, this building that you see before you is actually an adaptive reuse. It used to be a theater in uh, the Baywood Theater in downtown. And in, 2000, um, in 2009, the uh, owner came in and was proposing an idea of adaptive reuse of that building. Then the recession hit. Then after the recession, they came up with this idea. And so you see a green wall in the building. It's a very attractive, you know, creative reuse of that building. Um, and then the last question, so part of the reason why we're all here today is, what is San Mateo gonna be like in 2040? And your role here today is to help shape that. So our communities grow, and this just smart, smart planning, you know, to think ahead and plan for that future. So as we, as we think about, you know, how, how do we do that? There's a lot of things that are in our community that are important to all of us. Um, on the back, you know, sort of the background of why we do this and why it's important for communities to, to plan for the future, the state actually makes us do it. So it's actually a state requirement. They want you know, all communities to think ahead and plan for the future. So there are requirements to regularly update the city's general plan and also um, the housing elements to address housing needs as communities grow. Um, part of that is also our regional obligation. So some of you may have heard that there is a regional housing needs allocation. These numbers are come down from the state to the region as a whole. Then the region collectively, all the different uh, cities and the county collectively distribute that. And so cities are obligated to plan for and zone uh, enough properties in the city to be able to meet our fair share of housing so that developers can come in, nonprofit developers come in and basically pr build new housing. So again, it comes down from the state to the region and then down to the city. Um, the other thing that's important about the regional context is, you know, we're, we don't live in a, San Mateo's not in a bubble. You know, a lot of the issues that we are facing today, whether it's commute traffic, congestion, housing, it's shared regionally. People work and live in different places, and so all of that is interconnected. Um, woven into all of the things that affect the way that we live in going forward is also the, the issue of climate change. It is happening. Um, we see that in you know, more fires, um, different temperatures than, than how it used to be when we were growing up. So woven through all the things that we do as a community, we need to keep that in mind. We're, we're part of a region. A lot of these are shared responsibilities and we need to collaborate, you know, collaborate with other agencies to work towards solutions. Um, the last thing I wanna uh, mention is that um, at the local level, there's a lot of things that we can do. We know our community best. We know the folks that are living here, the folks that we care about. And so what we started doing with the vision statement workshops and community meetings was talk to community members and ask them to share their ideas, their hopes, their visions for the future. And this is what you know, has come out of all those workshops and community meetings is a collective vision for the future for 2040. This is a guiding statement that we should be working toward. 
Along with that, community members identified diversity as something that's very important to try to maintain and work, strive for. Balance, inclusivity, prosperity for the community, resiliency and adapting to climate change, and being a leader in that. So um, as I mentioned, you know, we have the vision statement and the values. And underlying all the work that we do, we want to make sure that you know, we are focusing on improving the quality of life for everybody in our community. And so that's the underlying, the core value um, underlying this process. So that's a lot of issues, a lot of topics, a lot of areas of you know, shared responsibility, shared concerns um, that we want to try to tackle. So how do we do that? And what's the general plan? What the heck is the general plan? Um, so, we thought this might actually help sort of connect from where we are. The general plan actually has, by state requirement, several elements or chapters, um, land use, housing, circulation, uh, conservation, open space, parks and recreation, safety, noise. We have one extra, which is urban design, and that's what we see in the built community. So these are the chapters that are uh, in the general plan which you know, along the way, we're going to be asking for your input into, into uh, you know, uh, those chapters and those topics. Along with that are the shared values that have been identified by the community. How the general plan, uh, the high level policies and uh, programs that are identified gets implemented is through additional tools. Specific plans focus in on smaller areas in the city, like the downtown specific plan that's actually identified in the map at, at your table. Um, along with that comes uh, design guidelines and the zoning code requirements. Anybody here who has done work on their house, you've read the zoning code, right? Memorized it? <laughs> so there are tools that help the community um, implement the visions and the goals that are established in the general plan. So we're, again, you know, this is one piece of a larger set of, of uh, tools in our, in our toolbox. At the end of all of this, um, <clears throat> you know, is really what, what it is that affects us as we live here. And so the general plan um, actually shapes the communities that we uh, live in. It affects the transportation uh, systems, the, the roads that we see, the sidewalks, the infrastructures that connect us and help us move around. So how that trickles down from a plan and policy document down to the way that we live and the quality of life. This is how it's connected. So one thing that I did want to mention, which is not on the slide, is that the last time this community did a comprehensive update on the general plan was actually in 1991, almost 30 years ago. You can imagine how the community has changed since then. Um, we did a mini update on a couple of chapters, a few chapters in 2010. Who was here during the Great Recession? You can imagine that the community's vision, the policies, the goals, the infrastructure projects that were identified at the time, the anticipated housing needs that were identified at the time, they were different. It was at the time of the Great Recession. Certainly those, um, those uh, policies and those ideas that were created at that time do not reflect what San Mateo is today and what this region is based on the, the economic success that we've been seeing. So, you know, throughout all of this, I want to again just highlight this is about the community. Um, and community members working together to identify the share and identify and work toward that shared future, uh, what we want in 2040. So again, just the, the vision statement, San Mateo is a vibrant, livable, and I can't read this very well, um, but you do have it at your table, so I'm not gonna read it. Um, and, you know, so it is there to remind us for something that we are focusing on for the future. And then in case you're wondering, where are we? So this is a multi-year effort. This is a, a very basic uh, update timeline for the general plan. And we're actually right now relatively early in terms of the, uh, the process. And what we're going to be doing today is to ask for your help in identify areas of potential change that you want us to study, um, areas of, of preservation. We do have two historic districts in, in downtown, you know, hearing from you about those areas would be helpful as well. You know, looking at uh, some of the regional and local growth information, we will be sharing that um, and hoping that you will consider that as part of your conversations. No decisions will be made today. Um, this is at the very early stage of a very a deliberate process in updating the general plan that we saw earlier. 
and there will be more opportunities for community input. <clears throat> so just real quickly, we've been around the community, you know, at workshops, at meetings, um, but we've also had one-on-one -on -one conversations pop up. So we've gone to Phil's, to the main library, to Central Park, to the Senior Center, um, to the train stations, and just casually, you know, approach people and ask them questions about San Mateo. So, all of this information is woven into what we're seeing as um, a, a crea more creative, um, different way of reaching out to the community and talking to people. <clears throat> so what we're doing with all of this um, includes uh, information sharing and as well as community conversations. We're here to learn, uh, listen, to talk, share, and hopefully discuss ideas for uh, the study areas. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to share some regional and local contexts. And first off, let's just start with the population growth in San Mateo. So post-war, San Mateo was less than 50K in terms of 50,000 in terms of population. Um, we've doubled to more than 100,000 people in San Mateo since, uh, since about 2018. Um, and the other line, the, dark, the uh, red line is actually San Mateo County. The county has grown quite a bit and we're, this is our share of that county growth. So it's clear that over time, you know, communities grow, not just San Mateo, but the entire Bay Area has grown over time. Other thing that's interesting is the change in demographics, the change in the folks that make up our community. Um, what's interesting is that you'll see that the uh, cohort, the 65 and older cohort, which is the green, it's been going up. And that's expected to continue to um, sort of increase that trajectory. I'm mean, seeing nods. <laughs> Great. Um, just real quickly, um, there is jobs and housing balance ratios. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard this um, either in the news or read it in newspapers or talked to friends about it. So jobs housing ratio, it shows the relationship between uh, where, where people work you know, uh, what cities they work in, and then where they live. And so that's, the race, that's uh, those two aspects of that ratio. Um, it's typically used as an indicator um, for longer or shorter commutes uh, between where you live and where you work. On the peninsula, and more jobs in housing uh, is what we're seeing. So along the peninsula, people, uh, f fewer people will live and work on the peninsula. And so you have more people who, maybe coming in from other communities coming to work here rather than uh, folks that live and work within the peninsula stretch itself. Um, generally speaking, at our San Mateo community level, we're trying to achieve a balance of one-to-one -one ratio. And part of this is the closer we get to one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the easier it is for people to get from home to work, the fewer cars potentially are on our freeways because the stretches of the commute are a lot shorter and the time for that commute is a lot shorter. <clears throat> So, uh, as I mentioned, there are common ways to measure a jobs. Household is another way. Um, it compares jobs to households. That's a little bit different than jobs to people. You can have more than one person in a household. Um, the other part of it is jobs to employed residents. And so, within San Mateo, about 54% of our population are employed. The rest of them are children. They're not old enough to work. Or they're uh, retired or are financially independent and don't need to work. Um, but those are typically the different numbers that you see um, out in, in the publications and in the studies that are out there. So jobs created versus homes in San Mateo. This is very specific to San Mateo um, City. And so you can see this in, in the city's annual housing report, which is on the city's website. Um, you know, so new residents that have come to San Mateo uh, since 2010, uh, you know, that's 5,834. And of that, you know, a portion of that are uh, employed, new employed residents. And as you can see, I don't, I don't know if you can see this really well in the back, but the new housing that's been produced in San Mateo during that same time frame is 2,244. And then the upper number is the number of new jobs, net new jobs in San Mateo. Can you guys read that? Okay, so new jobs is 16,773. New housing is 2,244. New residents is 5,834. New employed residents is 3,151. The slides will be posted on the Strive San Mateo website in, in case you guys wanna look at it later, but for today's exercise, 
just knowing that there is uh, a range of difference in terms of these numbers. <clears throat> Um, estimated growth for San Mateo City, new residents. Uh, this is growth going, thinking ahead. This is to uh, 2040. We're estimating, uh, based on information from ABAG, that it's gonna be about 25,000 to about 28,000 new residents to the city. Um, what that means in terms of household is between 8,000 to about 12,000 households and around 10,000 new jobs. <clears throat> And so, um, in terms of how we get from residents to households, um, you know, th these projections um, are information that's coming from ABAG, uh, the Association of Bay Area Governments. Their projections, their estimates, and they change over time. And so, what we're showing in this slide is information that we know today. If we get new numbers from them, you know, we'll share that. But at this time, this is what we have. We do think that um, population will grow in the future, and we're expecting. Um, just as planning professionals, we're expecting to see these numbers change <clears throat> and increase. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so in terms of future housing needs, um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we got the projections from uh, ABAG estimates, and that's a total of about um, 50, uh, this is a total household, not, not net increase, but just total household in San Mateo City is about 50,830. Um, with that, we do have projects that are in the pipeline right now for housing units. And so if we subtract what's projected in terms of the difference in, in net new households and the projects that we have in place for units, that means that we probably need to house by 2040, we need to have housing units to house about 8,000 to 9,000 new residents. These are additional housing units that we'll need. <clears throat> so along with growth, there's a lot of other implications as well. Um, it has uh, impacts on infrastructure as well as services. This isn't something that the city does alone in terms of addressing these, uh, the needs of the community. And so it's a collaborative effort with other agencies, including Caltrans. They're working on a um, one-on-one project for additional express lane that'll connect to Santa Clara County. Um, Caltrans also has a business plan that's projecting service improvements and infrastructure improvements um, through uh, to 2040. So the same, the same time frame that we're planning for with our general plan. Along with that, they're looking at electrifying the entire uh, Caltrain uh, corridor, and that's ex expected to increase capacity. For San Mateo, at our local level, we have a lot of concurrent projects. The bike master plan, which um, Public Works is leading right now, climate action plan. Um, we also have um, uh, uh, no, uh, money right now to fund child care services and, and programs and so that money is available to partner with uh, providers. Um, the Parks Department has uh, developed a recreation facility strategic plan so that's all the park and open space that's in the city. Public Works Department is, also has a multi-year almost one billion dollar project called the Clean Water Program and part of that program is in uh, upgrading our uh, wastewater treatment plant. And along with that, um, the city has, um, in the early 2000, we adopted um, a rare corridor plan uh, with the concept of transit-oriented development. And so we, we'll cover that in a bit. So a lot of work. <clears throat> so uh, one thing I, that's interesting to share um, is changing our commute mode. Um, as you can see, a lot of folks still drive today. About 70% of our population still drive alone today. But we're also seeing increasing numbers of those that choose alternative modes of transportation. Um, what's really interesting for me is my brother and my husband both work from home, and they're part of that 5%. We didn't see that number 10 years ago, you know, not that high. So what we're seeing is that many people still drive, um, but other folks are looking at alternative modes of getting around. And so that, those, that this trend, this change from what we used to have, is expected to continue. So we're likely to see fewer uh, cars, fewer drivers driving alone to work, and then changes in these other alternative modes of, of getting around and commuting to work. Um, before we get to the next chapter, I wanted to mention that um, at your table is a uh, study it's also on the Strive San Mateo website. I think one of you has it. 
um, it's called the, Sa the San Mateo and Analysis of Land Use Planning and Regional Growth. Yes, you wanna hold it up? Yeah, that every, oh great, everybody got one. So it delves into a lot more details with some of the numbers and data that you've been asking about. It is posted on the website as well so you can share it with friends and family. But it will go into a lot more detail in terms of the data than what we're covering today in the presentation. So just real quickly, I had mentioned that we do have transit-oriented development in San Mateo. Um, you know, this came from um, an adopted plan, the Rail Corridor uh, Plan, which is focusing on planning for development around two transit stations in San Mateo. And that was the Hayward Station and the Hillsdale Station. That plan was adopted in 2005. And what we're seeing in terms of construction today um, in the Bay Meadows area as well as along the uh, Concar um, Grant area is, are those projects. And so these are the, base, the basic performance of those projects. You know, conventional mode of uh, trips for the Station Park Green, you can see it's, it's more trips than if you were to do a TOD project, which is the blue. And that's the same with the uh, Heinz office project, which is at 400 to 450 Concar, and the Bay Meadows um, residential projects. So TOD as a concept for planning around transit, allowing folks to be able to have an alternative mode to get around. It's in terms of the trip reduction, it's been working. <clears throat> Sorry. So we're on to the next part, and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Joanna to walk you through the group exercise. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, my name is Joanna Jansen. I know a lot of you already. I work at PlaceWorks. We're the consultant that's helping the city with the general plan update. Uh, and we're almost ready to start your discussions. But before we do that, I just want to explain to you a little bit about what we're here to do today and what you're going to be doing when you start your discussions with your table in just, um, uh, just a few minutes. So we're going to run through that uh, very quickly because I'm excited for you guys to be able to get started. So the reason why we have uh, you here to talk about a map today uh, is because the general plan land use map is a very important piece of the general plan. Julia talked earlier about um, the elements of the general plan and how the general plan guides future development by setting the groundwork for things like specific plans and the zoning <laughs> ordinance and a lot of other um, regulations. So this general plan land use map is one of the first steps. The colors that are on this map ultimately guide decisions in the city about what can be built where and at what intensity. Um, and so as part of the overall general plan update, we're gonna be considering if there's places where this map also needs to be updated as part of the overall documents um, changes. And so that's why we're, we're starting with a map-based exercise today. So I'm gonna walk you through the process of how we're gonna get from today to that ultimate general plan land use map. Um, and I, we're, we're at the very first step in this process today where we're gonna work together to identify areas that should be studied going forward. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that step next, but before I do, I wanna just explain how this fits into the overall arc of this, this phase of the project. So we're here today to look at this map with you and help uh, ask for your input on where are areas that we should study. After we have gone through a process um, of identifying those study areas, which I'm gonna explain next, um, then we're gonna have another meeting like this to talk about, okay, now we know where we're gonna be focused, but what, what are we looking at? What kinds of land uses might should be considered in these different areas? So that we come up with a range of different scenarios, different alternative futures to study. Um, then we're gonna study those alternatives. We're gonna be evaluating a whole range of very important topics, things like um, traffic generation, the character of San Mateo, impacts on public services like schools, um, utilities. We're gonna be looking at public health and environmental sustainability, as well as the city's overall fiscal health and how future development might benefit uh, the community or what benefits could be pr um, provided from development as well as the feasibility of different types of development that um, is, con is considered as part of these alternatives. So we're gonna do a very extensive evaluation of the alternatives that we work with you to create. Then we're gonna come back to you with the results of that evaluation and talk about what we found, the pros and cons of the different alternatives. 
And based on that, with your input, again, we're going to narrow into a preferred alternative for further study. Um, and that alternative, um, again, with your input and the input of your decision makers, will become the basis for any updates to the general plan land use map. So that's where we're going with all this. And again, as you can see right here, we're just at the very, very um, first step in that process. And that process is going to take many months. And at every point that you see here, there's going to be additional opportunities for you and your neighbors um, and other decision makers to have input into the process. So let me just drill down a little bit then on our first step um, today of choosing the study areas and how this is going to work. So we're here today. Um, to, to do this exercise with you. We're going to have this same workshop again on Monday night. If you know folks who couldn't be here today or for a weeknight evening is easier for them, we're going to be um, at the Hillsdale High School cafeteria on Monday evening. Uh, and I would love to see some, some people there. In addition to that, we're going to be having an online um, mapping exercise during this phase. That's not live yet, but it's coming soon. And as always, we're accepting any written comments that you um, or anybody else wants to um, provide, and all of those are posted on the website and, and shared. We're going to go to the general plan uh, subcommittee on June 26th. They're going to hear about all the community input that we've collected so far, and they're going to have their own discussion about identifying study areas. And then similarly, we're going to go to the planning commission with that and the city council for, um, to give us some final direction on helping to identify the set of study areas that we're going to be looking for in the future phases. So all of these meetings, the, the, the workshop obviously, the general plan subcommittee, the planning commission, the city council, those are also open to the public. You are welcome and very much encouraged to come and give your comments there as well as we move through the study areas um, process. So when you are thinking with your, with your group about um, identifying study areas, there's, there's probably a whole range of different ideas and different perspectives in the room. I, I hope so. That's what we're here to hear about. Um, so these are some of the ideas that you might have when you think about identifying areas that we should look at um, for growth between now and 2040. Where are areas that are likely to change? Um, you're also welcome to identify areas that um, should stay the same. And, um, so either one, you might look, Julia showed you a second ago uh, some of the statistics about actual traffic counts, for example, from areas that have been developed near transit in San Mateo. Uh, if that seems compelling to you, you might identify areas near transit as one of your study area. Um, but you might have a lot of other ideas about study areas, and that's what we want to hear from, uh, from you today. So we, when we uh, start talking in just a few minutes, uh, I think you've already introduced yourselves, but if you might have had new folks join you or if there's any other um, introductions to make, you can start off just by making sure everybody knows each other. Uh, then I, I would suggest that you spend a few minutes talking about uh, the things that I just listed. What are, what are some of the things to you, before you dive in and start drawing things on the map, what are some of the characteristics of study areas that you think are important? And what do the other people think at your table about areas that they would like to see considered as study areas? So just talking more generally maybe about some of the characteristics of what makes a, a good study area um, or that you'd like to see evaluated in further detail. And then you can start drawing on your map, and I, I encourage you um, to do that. You have markers on your table. Um, please use the Sharpies, um, or you can use a pen if, if you need to, um, so that we make sure that the markers stay, stay permanent and don't get um, smudged off. And then at the very end, um, your facilitator is going to check in with you to summarize your work and then come up and give us a brief report back so that you'll all have a chance to hear what other tables worked on in addition to your own table. So let me just spend a minute explaining your map, and your facilitator can also go over this as well if you have any other um, questions about it. I think a lot of you had a chance when you first got here to take a look at your map on the table, but let me explain what's on it. Um, this is a map of the city of San Mateo. The black line that you see, the black dashed line, is the city limits, so everything inside there is the city, and that's what the city controls and, and can make decisions about. Uh, the areas in green, as you probably already figured out, are parks and open space. The areas in orange are school sites. Um, 
the each Caltrain station is mapped. Those are pretty clearly labeled. And then you'll see a circle around those Caltrain stations, including the Caltrain stations in Burlingame and Belmont outside of uh, San Mateo. That's a half mile radius around each station, just to give you a little bit of a sense of scale um, for those. And then the blue dots that you see, those are all bus stops. So if you're curious about where people might have access to transit, um, we're, we're showing you that with the Caltrain stations and the bus stops on the, on the map. And then finally, uh, the lavender parcels that you see on your map are sites that are requested uh, to be studied. So these are par properties where uh, the owner or an interested party has contacted the city and expressed interest in participating in the general plan update process and in studying the future of those sites and hearing from the community about what you're interested in, if anything, um, on those sites. As we begin our, oh, let me just say a couple other things that you have on your table really briefly. Um, you also have an aerial photo of San Mateo that just might help trigger your memory of what's in a given spot if you can't quite remember. Um, and then you have a general plan land use. That's the uh, map with all of the different colors on it. Um, and uh, we have a legend for that map as well in case you have questions about what those different colors mean. Uh, and then if, uh, all of you should have gotten a comment card when you came in that has this place for written comments on the front, um, as well as a map on the back if you wanna make any individual comments on a map or on the card. Um, just give those to any facilitator or city staff person. So last thing right before we start, we've heard throughout this process and certainly through the vision and values exercise about the importance of um, bal balance of diversity, of inclusivity here in San Mateo. I know that's important to all of you, certainly important to, um, to me and I know to city staff. So um, these are just some guidelines to help make sure that the conversations we have here today do make everyone feel welcome and included um, and get everyone a chance to participate. Uh, I know you guys will all um, be very kind uh, to each other and I appreciate that, so thank you in advance. Um, and thank you, as, as Drew said, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know it's a beautiful Saturday and we're really grateful for your time um, and your attention. So with that, I will let you get right down to it. Thank you. I'm gonna have the facilitators um, go ahead and start gathering your materials to come up here to the um, mic and give us just a, you know, if you each give a two minute report back on your table, then we'll finish right on time. So um, Lily, can you come on up and start us off please? Hello everyone. So um, I was the facilitator for table number seven. Um, so the high level of agreement, we have basically the southern half of the El Camino corridor, about a half a mile to three quarters of a mile out. Uh, most of it was about half a mile out, um, generally around the Hillsdale and um, Hayward Park stations, and then um, along 20th, kind of going all the way up to um, Alameda, and then on the southern end of town, kind of going uh, east. And then um, we had medium agreement on um, 101 to Bridge Point, and this was specifically to add connectivity to existing train stations, maybe by the use of like a loop shuttle so that that area gets incorporated um, into the, the transit oriented areas. And then the downtown area um, between, oh, <laughs> thank you, Ron, um, between El Camino and uh, South B Street between 2nd to 4th, um, kind of having that specific area um, studied for maybe um, pedestrian oriented activities and blocking off vehicular traffic. Um, <laughs> and then preserving all of the existing parks and open space, um, the sentiment was really, you know, we're becoming a little more urbanized. Um, so, maybe, so keeping all of those existing open space areas um, and amenities that help, you know, create the community um, and make it pretty. Um, and then, that's about it. Um, but the biggest area for us was the southern half of El, the El Camino corridor, as you can see. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Great job. OK. 
Okay, so table four, first, first of all, just assumed El Camino and downtown were priorities, but what we did was really dig into some of the little smaller, smaller areas. So the first area that our table talked about was the whole Delaware connection from downtown to Burlingame, where the Performing Arts Center is, and, and also the walkability circle from downtown into that neighborhood. So that was an area that was of interest to our table, and then there was, you know, how far into the existing residential was sort of, you know, a mixed, mixed uh, interest in that. Um, and then going south, Oh, uh, 25th Avenue was a spot of interest, the existing Burrell Shopping Center, um, and 42nd Avenue Shopping Center on El Camino, and then on the other side, uh, again, an area of uh, potential interest was the Delaware connection from downtown down to 92, and the linkages to Hayward Park Station. And there was interest in looking at uh, the 92 Norfolk section and the Norfolk Hillsdale uh, intersection. So that was ours. Hi, I'm Roscoe from Table Six, and <laughs> and our group uh, discussed. Um, Primarily um, areas, um, first we discussed uh, the golf course. Um, uh, our group discussed that the golf, golf is in decline and um, there, there may be potential for um, other uses in that area, in that, in that um, area, as well as preserving the Coyote Point and the green space around that. Um, the group also had um, specific ideas about um, developing uh, a study area between the Hillsdale train station and the Belmont Caltrain station, so an area, a, a potential Caltrain station in that area, or just kind of um, that area for um, potential change. Um, the uh, one point that we had discussed was the San Mateo County Event Center, and um, the group thought that the event center served a particular purpose and that it was important, but there could be other uses such as a hotel that could supplement um, the, the event center. Um, we were half in agreement, half disagreement regarding the, the area that's around the event center. So that would be Hillsdale Transit Center um, and kind of around Hillsdale Mall. So there could be housing mixed use um, in the area of, of TGIF and, and his furniture and as well as across El Camino. Um, and um, what, what that would look like, um, that, that was um, some discussion around that. Uh, and then also around Hayward Park, um, the, the areas that are beyond uh, Concar about more to the east that encompasses the, the Rakuten building as well as uh, the Marriott Hotel and then the um, the offices uh, to just to the north of that um, and then as well as downtown was a particular um, interest that change could happen there and that's an area that we should study um, areas basically that closely mimic half mile around that downtown train station. And that's all. Oh, oh, one more thing. The group also identified potential redevelopment for the site between the Waters Office Park and the Parkside Plaza, and then extending that um, potential study area to the Bridgepoint Shopping Center and the offices around that. Thank you. Hi there. So um, we were group five, and uh, just starting off the conversation, we thought about general sentiments that we wanted uh, for places to study, and those were areas where there could be mixed-use development or things that would provide better connections between work, home, services, and childcare. Um, and then we also thought that having better connections to public transit was super important, as well as better safety for bikes and pedestrians. Um, so those were all things that we thought about when we were looking at different. Um, places to consider, as well as um, decreasing parking lots. So um, starting off, we looked at the Hayward Park uh, Bart, or Caltrain station west of there. Um, and then we also looked at the Bridgepoint Shopping Center. Um, we also thought that the Hillsdale uh, Future Location Station um, west of that was a good area to look at for potential change. And then um, this area that's just 
southwest of um, highways like 92 and 101, and then also um, the office parks. We had a big section from uh, College of San Mateo all the way up to the Hayward Park Station. Um, we thought would be a good area to look at um, making changes to office parks or anything like that. So, yeah. I'm Kathy with Table 9. So our table, first of all, wanted to look at eliminating single-family zoning and allowing ADUs and duplexes and smaller scale development in all single family zones. Um, in addition, our map may, be, may look a little different than other people's because we were really focused not just on the area around the train stations, but also looking at major corridors of the city. So not also not just El Camino, but some of the other key corridors like Hillsdale and Alameda, and really looking at putting development where there's a good opportunity for future transit growth. So, you know, transit in the city is pretty limited to El Camino. We want to see more robust public transportation service along other major corridors. And that's not necessarily all high rises, like on Alameda, that's maybe more duplexes or lower density, higher density development than what's there now. So that type of thing. Um, in addition, we really talked about setting aside specific sites that are public for affordable housing, especially a lot of the Caltrain land around the Caltrain corridor. Um, we wanted to be very sensitive to displacement of vulnerable communities. Um, we wanted to create better pedestrian and bicycle networks, east, north, and north, south, to support the development areas that we talked about. Um, we also focused a lot on retail centers because of the changing nature of the retail industry. So that includes some of the smaller shopping centers in Bridgepoint. Um, let's see. And another critical piece we also wanted to look at is within these areas, looking at more opportunities for pocket parks and smaller parks to create open space to accommodate the people that will be living in the areas. I think that's all. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve. I was the facilitator for Table One. We were very lucky to have uh, people who really know the city well, somebody who rides transit all the time. The city is blessed with lots of shuttles and lots of transit that you may not even be uh, uh, know that it's there, but it certainly is. So we, we had a good group. I'm not going to hold up the map. It's pretty similar to the maps you've seen so far. Um, but one of the th things we didn't emphasize was really looking at preserving historic communities tucked into some of the transit areas and other parts of the city really looking at keeping those as they are, trying to build around those as much as possible. Um, and uh, we, we really looked at the El Camino corridor, especially south of 92 where there is a lot of underutilized land. Uh, we recognize that a lot of transit infrastructure is going to be needed for any type of development with higher density in the long run to really help address the uh, trips, uh, trip generation issue. Um, looked at increasing height areas, possibly on El Camino around Hillsdale. Um, also, the issue of mixed use. Now, I know that we're, we're really drawing lines on maps, but the issue of mixed use came up because oftentimes you see that it, mixed use development is underutilized. So we uh, like the idea of maybe having more of a flex space concept for ground floor as opposed to just saying it has to be retail or has to be something more specific. Um, anyway, so. Uh, uh, the other last thing is we did uh, talk about the options of integrating some level of multifamily development into some of the R1 neighborhoods in the long run. So uh, that's it. Thank you. So just very briefly, uh, a lot of the um, discussions that you all had uh, mirror what we talked about at our table, uh, table one. Um, but we did have some other discussions uh, about uh, that haven't been mentioned about existing school sites and maybe that's an opportunity to study as uh, something to benefit the community with more recreation areas or possibly uh, development. Um, we talked about El Camino Real, single family neighborhoods as a kind of a study area encapsulating all of those and talked about pocket parks, uh, recreation open space that's existing and seeing if there can be any additional amenities around those. Um, so I think that will, and we talked about the decline of commercial areas, and uh, we had knowledgeable folks uh, that actually knew individual parcels, so we talked about opportunities at specific sites, which was really fascinating. So.
and our workshop is about to turn into a pumpkin, so I'll forego the map. Uh, I was a facilitator for Table 2, uh, very similar themes. Uh, there were sort of two overarching themes we had, and that was a focus on underutilized areas that are near transit and have good access to pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Uh, and then also just an overarching concern that development really be conscientious of all the things that need to be considered. So areas that we looked at included uh, the community college, uh, some of the lower intensity uh, areas in the vicinity of the downtown, uh, El Camino Real, as well as uh, Delaware and 25th Avenue, and then uh, lastly the Hillsdale Mall area and other maybe underutilized uh, mall or retail spaces. And then issues that were identified were making sure to preserve existing affordable housing and affordable retail spaces, uh, a real concern around making sure that neighborhoods continue to have services, both in terms of those retail services, but also public services, and ensuring that you know, schools are adequate and that in those areas that are being developed, that people really have access to schools. And then finally, uh, a major theme to just cap everything off was uh, this notion of improving transit and bicycle and pedestrian access to really make sure that as this new development is occurring, people have alternatives uh, to getting in their cars and clogging the streets. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Again, I want to thank you for being here. A lot of commonalities among the tables, as you heard, and also some really creative um, and, as Abe said, fascinating ideas. So very rich, very productive conversations today. I hope all of you will continue to be involved. I hope you will can encourage your friends uh, and neighbors and coworkers to get involved. Um, if you have a comment card, city staff, placework staff, raise your hand. You can give it to any of us. Um, and please um, stay abreast on the website, strivesanmateo.org. Um, we, we, this library is an amazing resource. As somebody who works all over the Bay Area, I can tell you it's a really a gem. Um, and I think there are some other folks who are ready to use it this afternoon. So uh, thank you very much for being here and enjoy the rest of your Saturday.